to remember for the rest of your life. The Pro Football Hall of Fame is excited to present the heart of the Hall of Famer program, connected by Extreme Networks. With over 100 Hall of Famers participating, we have reached 47 states and countries all over the world, sharing the message that football is more than a game and can teach Americans important life values like commitment, integrity, courage, respect, and excellence. But you have to make right decisions even when nobody's watching you. Well, respect is not just given out. It's not handed out like a, like a, like a brochure. It's <clears throat> Today, you are presented with an opportunity to meet and learn from one of the greatest football players of all time. But more important than that, the chance to see that their Hall of Fame life wasn't given to them. They didn't roll out the bed great. They put the work in, on the field, in the weight room, in the classroom, in their communities. They made themselves a Hall of Famer on and off the field. Your feet can't take you where your mind's never been. Because you can make it, but it's just gonna take a little hard work, and some effort, and the drive and determination. And today, you will learn you can do the same thing they did. You don't have to have a gold jacket or a bronze bus to make a difference in the lives of others. It's your decision whether you want to be a successful student, son, daughter, brother, or sister. If attitudes are contagious, is your attitude worth catching? It's integrity as well because when you decide to pursue something and you don't quit, that says a lot about you. Commitment to excellence. We can all aspire to be the best. Welcome to a once in a lifetime program, the heart of a Hall of Famer program connected by Extreme Networks. You know, there were times I remember I had to fight just to hold my head up. Those times when even my friends tried to make a fool of me. There were things that my heart would attack that they just couldn't see. Some said I was hopeless, a mind tangled in the night. But guess what? Strong hearts just keep going. And that's why I'm standing here tonight at the steps of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I've seen the light and the sun break through the storm, and I'm standing here as a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And I stand here tonight on the shoulders of the 354 Hall of Famers that helped make the NFL and pro football the great game that it is today. Good hook. And with that, I'd like to welcome everybody to Eisenhower High School in Aldean, Texas for our latest installment of the Pro Football Hall of Fame's Heart of a Hall of Famer program connected by Extreme Networks. Today, featuring that man you just saw on your screen, Mr. Drew Pearson, before we bring that special guest up on stage, like I know you don't want to hear from me the entire time, we got to go through some things. First, my name is Jake Ray. I'm the Youth and Education Manager at the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. I'm super excited today for you guys, all everybody who's in front of us here in Texas and all the schools we have connected in to learn a little bit more about who Drew Pearson is. At the Pro Football Hall of Fame, it's our mission to honor the heroes of the game, to preserve its history, to promote its values, and to celebrate excellence everywhere. And those values we promote are those of commitment, integrity, courage, respect, and excellence, all of which not only make our Hall of Famers, Hall of Famers on the football field to get them that gold jacket, it makes them Hall of Famers off the field, better fathers, sons, brothers, members of their community. And you'll be uh, surprised to see today how often those values come up in the answers that Mr. Pearson talks about. Not just his football success, but his success off the field as well and what the game of football taught him. So I know I'm excited today and I hope everybody out there is excited as well to hear those answers from our special guests. Um, but before we do get started, I do have a few people I'd like to thank first and foremost, our great partners at Extreme Networks for all they do for us at the Pro Football Hall of Fame, specifically for this Heart of a Hall of Famer program. Without their support, this program couldn't take place today for all of you students to tune in uh, and listen and learn. So for them, thanks for all they do for us, all they do for schools around the country. And like we said, the program could not take place without their support. 
Secondly, I'd like to thank our teachers and educators, administrators, anybody that allowed us to come into their classroom today, whether here in Texas or across the country. Um, thanks for allowing us to be just a small part uh, of your students' learning experience. And then lastly, I'd like to thank all of our students. You know, today, uh, this program is for you. This program doesn't take place if you guys don't ask your questions. So I'm excited to see the questions that we have today. Uh, we'll have about six or seven different schools asking questions. Uh, interactive, you'll see them pop up on your screen. We'll have some students here ask some questions and, and, and Eisenhower as well. We have a bunch of schools who are watching on Zoom. If you have a question you'd like to be asked, go ahead and throw it in the chat. We've got some awesome staffers, uh, Jerry Shockey and Nathan Martin back at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Uh, looking through all of those, um, if you submit a question, let us know your name, the school you go to, and your question. And we'll do our best to, uh, to add it in as part of the program. And then lastly, if you're watching us on Facebook, the Facebook stream that's all over the world, and you have a question, we want to hear from you as well. Put your question into the comment section. Uh, we're monitoring that as well. Um, and we will, if we can, we'll make some of those questions part of the program as well. So without further ado, I would like to bring up on stage our special guest today, Hall of Famer, class of 2021 gold jacket, Dallas Cowboy legend, the famous end of the famous Hail Mary from Roger Staubach, wide receiver, Mr. Drew Pearson. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. All right. It's a pleasure to be here at Eisenhower. And uh, thanks for having me uh, here today. And Jake, thank you for making it all happen. Thank you. Well, we're, we're super excited. It wasn't just me. A lot of people had their hand in, um, in making this program possible today. Um, first off, we didn't bring the rain in. I want to put that out there. That, that was not our fault. Um, but those five values I talked about. Yes. Commitment, integrity, courage, respect, and excellence. You know, those are just five of the hundreds of values the game of football can teach that you can use in your everyday life. Um, do one of those stick out as most important to you, or do all five kind of work together like a football team, work as a team to make, you know, the best person that you can be? Yeah, I think uh, all five have to work together for you to be that type of person you want to be with those type of qualities. And there's no question that uh respect integrity character and all that is earned as you heard the message there uh you can't be told you can't tell anybody i want to be respected you got to earn that respect uh but the things that made us with the dallas cowboys uh the players that i played with the things that coach landry looked in those players the number one thing was that character, the integrity, the commitment, and all that that you have to have to even start to try to reach your goal or achieve anything you're trying to achieve. The second thing you have to have is intelligence. You gotta be smart. You need your education, okay? The good Lord gives us a talent to do something, each and every one of us. Uh, what we have to do is cultivate that talent. And the way you cultivate that talent is through the tools of education. And that's why intelligence is so important in anything that you do. That's got to be a big part of your success. The third thing that needs to be a big part is your passion. Okay? You got to love it. Whatever you get into it, you got to love it. If you love it, then you'll make a commitment. You know? I love to play football. You know? And my mother needed to find me. She knew where to go. I'm at the ball field each and every day, all day, because this is what I wanted. You know, football, sports was my passion. You know, yours might be music. You know, yours might be art. You know, it's different things that drive us. And that passion is what we have to show that how much we love it. Because if you don't love it, you're not going to succeed in it. That's passion. And then the final thing, as I said, is the talent. We're all talented to do something. If you have the first three, character, intelligence, and passion, and some talent, you might end up being a pro football Hall of Famer. That's what I'm saying, okay? So I, I think that's great because, you know, you give all those examples. And for students, you know, some it's going to go one ear and right out the other because we were both in those seats at one point in, in events yeah. like this. Some are going to take it to heart. 
Um, but I think what can really push that message forward is, you know, real life examples. So you look at your football career on the football field for the Cowboys. Was there a specific moment where one of those values stood out to you where the light bulb kind of, or the, you click, the light bulb went off when you're like, oh, I get it now. Was there a moment that for you in your career when that happened? You know, the moment was, uh, I guess, when I made the Dallas Cowboys, uh, because that told me I did the right things through training camp to make that Cowboy football team, which was very difficult. I was an undrafted free agent. I didn't get drafted into the NFL. And that's back when they had 17 rounds of the draft. They only have seven now. They drafted 452 players that year, and nobody thought Drew Pearson was good enough to waste a draft pick on. Now, I'm almost over that. I can't dwell on the negatives. You can't dwell on negatives in life. You got to move on. But not being drafted motivated me to try to want to prove them wrong, that I did belong in the NFL. So that was my motivation. So every time I took a lap around the field before practice, I thought about how disappointed I was when my name wasn't called. I thought about the tears that I shed when my name wasn't called as I ran those laps around field. And I wanted that day, that practice that day, to show them that I belong. And now you add those days up, and before you know it, you make that Dallas Cowboy football team. So the, the moment really came when I made the team. Now I know I did the right things. I brought the character to the table. I brought intelligence to the table. I brought passion to the table. And I brought the talent to the table. And that's what you got to do. When you realize that, you know, you have a chance to be successful. Whatever you do, you know, doctor, lawyer, technician, electrician, mortician, whatever you want to be, you know, you got to have those qualities to be successful. Awesome. Well, without further ado, I think we'll get started with our questions. And what better place to start than right here uh, in front of us at Eisenhower High School. So if there are any students out there, I th to be honest, I can't see anybody out here. These lights are very, very bright. Um, so if you have a question, raise your hand. We have a microphone up here. Uh, first come, first serve. Whoever wants to ask a question, step up to the microphone. And uh, we'll go ahead and get a question here. Don't be shy. Somebody's got a question. Come on up. Step right up. Somebody's got to have a question. All right, so I see a hand. All right, come on. You go. Yep, come on up. We got a question here. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, have our student here. They're walking up to the microphone. Just uh, announce yourself, your name. Uh, the school you go to, and then your question here for Mr. Pearson. Um, my name is Patricia Matthews, and I go to Nimitz High School. Um, my question for you is, uh, do you remember any point in time where you genuinely felt like you wanted to give up pursuing what you were trying to pursue? Oh, yeah. You know, when you're going through the process, you know, you get that little guy on your shoulder telling you to give up, you know, and you got the other guy trying to encourage you, you know. Well, you got to listen to the guy that's encouraging you, you know, because through the process, you're going to run into obstacles. You're going to run into challenges. You're going to run into adversity. And what you need to do is use those obstacles, use those challenges, and use that adversity to step on to bigger and greater things, you know. Learn from the challenges. Learn from that adversity. So you're going to, there'll be times, yeah, that I thought I'd give up football. I said, this is not for me. But if you want it bad enough, you'll keep fighting. You'll keep striving to try to achieve uh, the goal that you're trying to reach. So the key is you're going to face adversity. You're going to face challenges. You know, just like in a football game, you don't score a touchdown every time you touch the football. You know, the first thing you learn when you have to play football is learn how to tackle, get tackled and get up and then get tackled again, then get up, then get tackled again, then get up and act like you're having a good time doing all this, you know? So it's the challenges. You know, each time I got tackled, I got up and got back in that huddle and ran another play. And that's what you got to do. When you face those challenges in your life, you got to get up, use that challenge, learn from that challenge, and go on to the next challenge because it's going to be there. 
Good question. Give that's her a, a hand, y'all. That's a great way to start out the program. All right. <laughs> All right, we're going to start now going through all of our schools we have connected in all across the country. So our first um, school we're going to go to is the Young Men's Leadership Academy. I believe they are out of Texas, where we are today. Uh, so go ahead and unmute your microphone there, uh, Coach Pang, and go ahead and ask your question. Starting your college career as a quarterback in college, how did you react to being converted to a wide receiver? So starting your college career which is this fact right. I just learned you were a quarterback. Yes. Then moved to wide receiver. What was that transition like? And how did you maybe use those values uh, in that transition? Yeah. Well, you know, I played quarterback in high school and uh, I was pretty good. I made all state, but my favorite sport was baseball, you know, coming through. When I graduated high school, I was 5'11", 145 pounds. So I wasn't built like no football player. I was built more uh, like a baseball player. Uh, but, you know, as you go on, you can't play both sports. When I got to Tulsa, I had to make a decision, and that decision was to give up uh, baseball for football. And once I made that decision, then I made that commitment to football, and I used everything I had within me to try to take advantage of that. The first thing it did, coming out of high school, it got me a chance to go to college, got me a chance to extend my education, and that was important. So football did that for me. And then I'm in college, get a great education for four years at Tulsa University. And now it gives me an opportunity to go on to continue to play football in the National Football League, the NFL. And so all these things have to fall in place in your lives for you to have a chance to be successful. This is my path, all right? The good Lord gives us a path, all of us a path to try to achieve the success. And there's disaster, you know, there's disappointment, but there's also good and there's also hope along that path. And you gotta follow that path. And I stayed on my path. A lot of people try to deter me, you know? You're not big enough to play football. You can't do this, you can't do that. I even had a uh, 10th grade teacher back in South River High School, Miss Gracie Dunn, all right? And I was in her English literature class and we're studying Shakespearean literature and all that. And I could hardly, you know, a brother from New Jersey, <laughs> I, I didn't know anything about Shakespearean literature. So I had a little trouble in her class. You know what she told me? She said, Drew, you'll never pass this class. She said, Drew, if you do pass this class, you'll never graduate high school. She said, Drew, if you do graduate high school, you'll never go to college. She said, Drew, if you do go to college, you'll never go to college. You know what? After I got my college degree, I went back to see Miss Gracie Dunn, okay? I went to see Miss Gracie Dunn, all right? God rest her soul, by the way. And I took, took that degree and put it in front of her, and I said, Miss Gracie Dunn, how do you like me now? How do you like me now? You're the one that motivated me by telling me I couldn't do something. And that motivated me, just like trying to get into the NFL, not getting drafted. They're telling me I'm not good enough. Anybody time anybody told me I wasn't good enough to reach what I was trying to achieve, I used that as motivation. And that's what you got to use as motivation. Find your Miss Gracie Dunn. All right. You All got right. one? All right. <laughs> All right. Find your Miss Gracie Dunn and let that be your motivation to achieve what you need to achieve. Amen? That's All right. right. Amen. <laughs> All right. We're going to go to our next school now. We're going to go to Avon Middle School back in my home, back up in Ohio. All right, Ohio. To Avon Middle School for our next question. So go ahead and have a student step up to the microphone and go ahead and ask your question. We can't hear you. Looks like you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. All right, now we got you. What do leaders in the locker room mean to a team? Can you repeat that one more time for us? What do leaders in a locker room mean to a team? Leaders in the locker room, how important they are to a team. Whoa, that is very important. You know, you got to have good leadership to be successful. Uh, when I was with the Dallas Cowboys, our leadership was with Coach Tom Landry, who was the head coach. 
and he was a tremendous leader. And he was a tremendous leader because he had authority. We knew he made the final decision whether we we're going to be on the Dallas Cowboys or not. His leader, he was a great leader because he was intelligent. He was smart. He trusted, uh, we trusted him because of that intelligence. And he was also a great leader because of the respect that he had, and he earned that respect. Uh, I, one of the greatest things that I prided myself on being a Dallas Cowboy when I was elected captain of the Dallas Cowboys, the years that Coach Landry selected individual captains, I was selected captain five times. I was captain when we won the Super Bowl against the, the, uh, the uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. We won the Super Bowl against the, the uh, Denver Broncos. And that was important to me. OK, I wanted to be that guy. You can't be a leader. There's no second teamers leader. You got to be one of the good guys. You got to be one of the players to be a leader. If you want people to follow you, you got to do the right things yourself. We had a guy named Roger Staubach. He was my quarterback, you know, and he was a tremendous leader. He went to the Naval Academy. He served in Vietnam before he became a Dallas Cowboy. And he learned a lot of leadership skills and a lot of, had a lot of leadership traits. And he was the leader. So I learned from him. You know, I learned how to be a good pro football player. But he, through his leadership, he taught me how to be a professional, how to carry myself, how to answer questions, how to talk to people, how to know when people talk. When you talk to people, they'll know if you're educated or not. Because as soon as you open your mouth to speak, People are going to know if you're educated or not. And so you and I learned all these things from Roger Staubach, a leader. And then I use those to become a leader myself. And when the other players on that team look up to you and look up to you for motivation and that leadership, man, that is a great feeling. But it's also a tremendous responsibility. All right. That means you got to go out there and perform. You can't tell somebody, let's go, let's go. If you're dropping passes, you're missing tackles, all right? You're fumbling the football. So you got to go out there and do your thing, and that's what makes you a good leader because you're doing your thing, and others are trying to follow that because they see what you're doing, and they want to have that kind of success as well. So that's what it all being a leader is all about. And I enjoyed that role. I, uh, when I got, in, got out of football, I became a leader of my own business, and I use all the qualities I learned as a Dallas Cowboy and, a, and apply them into the business world. And thank God, in my business life, after football, I made a lot more money than I did playing football. <laughs> that sounds like a pretty good ending to your, to your career there. Thank you for that question. Great question. Yes, great question. Very good question. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, part of our mission at the Hall of Fame is obviously to honor great heroes like yourself. Um, but it's at the core of it, we are a museum. And it, it's to preserve the history of the great game of football from way back in its infancy to guys who were breaking records. Tom Brady just threw his 600th touchdown, the first quarterback to ever do it. So we're, we're preserving all that history. So when we have these programs, we want to be able to showcase that history to all of us, to not only to our gold jackets, but to all of the great um, students we have connected in. So we thought, what better way to do that than actually give you a live look in to our Hall of Fame archives with John Kendall, one of our great teammates at the Hall of Fame. So I'm going to throw things to John Kendall to talk a little bit about the archives and this guy right here beside me. So, John, floor is yours. Take it away. All right. Thank, thanks, Jake. Drew, it's always great to see you. Um, my name is John, John Kendall, Director of Archives and Football Information here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And where we're standing at is the Ralph Wilson Jr. Pro Football Research and Preservation Center. So when, when Jake talked about our mission to honor the heroes of the game, preserve its history, promote its values, and celebrate excellence everywhere, uh, this is really at the core of what we do. We're honoring the great heroes of the game, uh, uh, like Drew, and, and really not just the 354 individuals who have a bronze bust in Canton, but every player, coach, and contributor who built the game to what it is today by preserving their legacies through their artifacts and documents. And then we're able to craft and share stories of excellence uh, and, and value. So the commitment, integrity, courage, respect, excellence that we talk, talk about, uh, we're able to showcase that the same values that made Drew great on the football field were, were things that when he left the, the playing, uh, his playing days, uh, he, he was, uh, had a PhD in those values, and he was able to take those to his business life and his personal life and, and, and develop uh, 
you know, in, in those areas as well. So it just goes to show you that the same values that, that made Drew great on the football field are the same things that, that can make you a great student, a great teacher, a great business leader. And then, you know, some of the artifacts that we have down here, uh, you know, we have over 55,000 game programs in our collection. This isn't pro football related, but one of probably our most unique. This is Princeton versus Yale, 1880, the first ever college football championship game program. So pretty remarkable. Uh, we have pretty much every book ever written on pro football history. Um, you know, uh, scouting reports from another great wide receiver here. This is Jerry Rice's scouting report from the 1984 and 1985 seasons uh, when he was drafted uh, first overall by the Birmingham Stallions in the USFL. And then uh, this is a great ar uh, artifact, J.J. Uh, Watts uh, jersey from the 2012 season. That was the first of his three Defensive Player of the Year awards. But for me, uh, this jersey is more about what he did on the football field and the 20 and a half sacks that season, the 16 passes defense, the 39 tackles for loss. For me, this is about all the great things that the players and coaches do within their communities. You know, when, when we had the flooding in Houston a few years back, you know, JJ used his platform as an NFL player, not to do it alone, but to bring people together and help uh, rebuild the Houston community. And so, so many great stories of individuals doing things just like JJ did there. Uh, and, and we want to not only preserve that history, but showcase it and share it with the rest of the, the, the country and the rest of the world, really. And then over here, we have some things related to Drew. Drew, thank you so much uh, being uh, in, inducted here in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. We, you know, you, you, you all will get a chance to go out to the museum and actually see his, his locker that, where, where many of his artifacts are on display. But here we've got some photos. We got this game program from the 1984 season. The Cowboys were celebrating their 25th season. And, and there you're represented on the front of their game day program. We've got uh, your Pro Bowl helmet. Here that, that you loaned to us. Um, and then this is uh, with the, the NFC, the, the National Football Conference there, uh, front and center. So all these types of things that, that we have here, we're preserving them uh, just like they're uh, priceless pieces of art. And, and it's not just about that helmet and it's not just about that jersey or, or these documents. It's really about the stories and the values um, that, that you utilized every day to achieve uh, your goals, whether it be a team goal, winning Super Bowl championships, or personal goals like reaching the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And so one uh, stat that I don't know if you're aware of, Drew, uh, you, you kind of touched on it earlier in the conversation today, but there are more undrafted college free agents inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame at 21 than there are number one overall draft picks, 15. So that's quite a, a staggering number. And I just had a, a bunch of college free agents here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame and in our archives that I chatted with. And when I shared that stat, their, their, their jaws dropped to the floor. And they, you know, I, I think it started to uh, build inside of them that the things that they're working for are still in front of them and that they can accomplish you know, being right here in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And so I, 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 my question for you, I guess, is hearing that stat, what, is that, um, what does that mean to you? And and secondly, um, how do you think that, um, you know, does that journey that you took make being enshrined in the Pro Football Hall of Fame that much sweeter? Uh, yeah, actually, that stat means a lot to me. I didn't, I didn't know that. Thanks for bringing that to my attention, John. Uh, yeah, it's pretty impressive. Uh, but you know what that tells me? It's about opportunity, you know? The NFL is a league of opportunity. You know, you come in as a number one draft choice or you come in as an undrafted free agent. Once you get there, the opportunity is the same. You know, you're going through the same paces as that number one draft pick as you are coming in as a free agent, undrafted free agent. So that's what it tells me is about the opportunity that the NFL uh, grants us to play in this game. And you don't have to be a number one draft pick. OK, that's what it's telling you. You can take the long way around, the road less traveled, a Robert Frost poem. Look it up. Look it up. Yeah, no, y'all heard of that one? Y'all heard of that one? All right, the road less travels. Everybody's going this way. Sometimes you got to take the road less traveled, which is lined with a lot of adversity, a lot of challenges, and stuff like that. And that's the free agent route. When you go in as a number one draft pick, it's a little easier because everybody is expecting you to do some things. But you come into free agent route, 
no one's expecting you to do anything. So you got to prove everybody wrong. And that's the challenge. And I, you know what? I'd rather take the road less traveled. I'd rather take the long way around because it made me a better person. Hood, hood. Hood, hood. That's right. All right. We're going to go back to some of our schools now. For thank our you, next John. Question. Yes. Thank you, John. Appreciate the live looking. Uh, we're going to go back to some of our schools. Our next school we're going to go to is Bethel Tate Middle School. And they're having some camera issues, so we're not going to be able to see them. But we can hear them, and that's right. important. So, Bethel, whenever you're ready, have your student go ahead and introduce themselves and ask their question. Hi, my name is Lauren from Bethel Tate Middle School. And other than the not getting drafted, what was a what was a challenge that taught you an important lesson? Challenge in your career. So you obviously go undrafted, first challenge, right out the gate. Right. Throughout your career, were there other challenges you had to face, and how did you overcome those? Uh, yeah, throughout my career, definitely challenges each week, and trying to be prepared to play an NFL football game is a challenge. But also, you know, you had other things happen in your personal life. You know, during a game, I found out my father had passed away and had to deal with that. Coach Landry asked me if I wanted to take the rest of the game off. I said, oh, no, my dad would not want that. I had to go back out there and play and, and let that out. But the real challenge for me came when I retired, when I had to retire from the game of the NFL, okay, game of football. And the reason I retired is because I was in a car accident. And in that car accident where I was driving, I lost my brother who was riding in that car with me. And now I had to overcome that kind of challenge to uh, deal with that and still overcome that. You know, that's a burden. That's a something that you have to carry for the rest of your life. And so how do you deal with that? You put it in perspective and try to deal with it and understand why you were spared maybe in that accident as opposed to your brother. So now what do you do with that? You try to take it and do, try to spread it around as much as you can and try to make people's lives because you're a Dallas Cowboy, you were spared. And that's what the good Lord gave me the opportunity to do. And he capped that by being a pro football hall of famer, you know? So I see people at the grocery store, they say, Oh, you're Drew Pearson. Can I get your autograph? I'd say, Oh yeah. You know, you sign that piece of paper. You say, you just made my day, you know? And I say, you know, my, they say your dad, my dad was a big fan of yours. I say, get him on the phone. Let me talk to him. You know, you talk to him, you made that guy's day. So that's what the good Lord spared me in that situation to do, you know, to take advantage of the opportunity he gave me through playing pro football, the rate name recognition and notoriety he gave me through pro football to use it to help and make other people's day, to bring some joy, bring a smile to somebody's face, okay? And I had that ability to do that and the good Lord spared me in that situation, that tragic situation. And now you say, how? Do I handle that? Well, I handle it by honoring him and honoring the people that I have a chance to meet and making their day because of the opportunity I have to still be here as opposed to my brother being gone. God rest his soul. And, you know, and that's the cool thing about that because, you know, Hall of Famer, famous football player, like you said, you know, you get recognized in the grocery stores or at the airport and you're making that person's day. But the cool thing is for all of our students out here today, they don't have to be a Hall of Famer. They don't have to be somebody famous. They could pick up a piece of trash in the hallway. They could help someone pick up their books and make just as much of an impact as that's, somebody talking to their dad on the phone. That's a great point. You know, we all have that opportunity, you know. You know, kindness is within all of us. We just got to exude that and give it back, okay? You know, a lot of time we don't want to talk to nobody. We walk past somebody. We put our head down. We don't say hi no more and that type of thing. You know, just a little respect. Say hi. You know, how's it going? Ask somebody, how's your day going? All those kind of little things make a difference. They certainly make a difference in somebody's life. Absolutely. Great question, Lauren. Yes, Good job, great Lauren. Question. All right. Our next group we're going to go to, we're going to go to Yucca Elementary School uh, for our next question. So go ahead. When you're ready, there are students at Yucca. Go ahead and walk up to the microphone. Go ahead and unmute yourself and then ask your question for Mr. Pearson. Hello, I'm Amelia from Yucca Elementary, and our question is, who is your biggest rival, and why did you respect them in, like, any way? 
biggest rival. I'm biggest sure rival? You. <laughs> yeah, being a Dallas Cowboy, everybody was a rival, okay? <laughs> everybody hated the Dallas Cowboys. It's, it's funny with the Dallas Cowboys. You either love us, really love us, or you really, really hate us, okay? There's no in-between thing there. Uh, but our, my biggest rival, or our biggest rivalry, when I was coming through as the Dallas Cowboys, with any team that we played in the NFC East, that was our division that we're in. So you're talking about the New York Giants, the Philadelphia Eagles, the uh, uh, Washington Redskins, or the Washington Football Club, or the St. Louis Cardinals. They were in the East then, and St. Louis is Arizona now. But anyway, those are our biggest rivalries. And so those were the ones, the biggest challenges. And the, there were bigger challenges than, some, say, some of the other games because you're competing for that division title, but also you play these guys twice a year. You know, whatever you did the first time around might not work the second time around. So you got to make some adjustments when you play them the second time around. And then when I played, you know, a lot of times in, uh, what you see a lot in the NFL now is a lot of transition, M players moving from team to team and that type of thing. When I played, the players didn't move. All right. You played against the same players almost all your career, the same defensive backs, the same defenses, the same teams, uh, the same players on those teams. So it was a little different back then. But uh, those were the biggest rivals. And uh, that's a great question. And there's still rivals to the Dallas Cowboys. And that's why I can't stand the New York Giants, the Philadelphia Eagles or the Washington football team. Hold up. <laughs> The, the, that never leaves, does that it? That never, never leaves. leaves, does it? All right. Um, I know we have a ton of questions from students, uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to throw it back to the Hall of Fame to Jerry Shockey, who's in our studio, who's watching some of these Facebook Live and uh, Zoom questions come through. He says we got a ton, so he's got a, the, the, the job to, to find the best one to ask our next question. So, Jerry, whenever you're ready, uh, take it away. Boy, Jake, that's a lot of pressure on me there, buddy. I uh, appreciate you, uh, Mr. Pearson. Appreciate you uh, being here today. We have uh, like 45 attendees uh, that are that are submitting tons of questions. Great job, you guys, all the students that are tuning in from all across the country. You guys do an amazing job here today. Wish we could do this for three hours and answer them all. Uh, but I had to pick out one that I thought was, uh, uh, they're all great. So this one is going to come from uh, Net Kong Elementary in New Jersey. And Net, the students there want to know, uh, what are some ways you have had to persevere through adversity in your life. I know you talked about your brother. Is there, are there any other uh, moments in life that really demonstrated perseverance through adversity? Uh, yes. When I left South River, New Jersey to go to Tulsa, Oklahoma, you know, it was a little culture shock. Uh, in South River, New Jersey, I wore Madras shirts, khaki pants, and saddle shoes. Not black and white saddles, so don't they're, they're kind of burgundy and black. <laughs> And then I go to Tulsa and everybody's got jeans and boots and big old belt buckles and cowboy hats and things like that. And they laughed at the way I dress. They laughed at my accent, the way I talk. They laughed at the way I ate. Everything that I did, you know, was a joke to these guys until, until we got on the football field. And that was the equalizer because you can be all this outside but once you get in that environment on a football team it all comes together and now let's see whose talent rises to the top and that's what i was able to do and that became the equalizer and what that equalizer did for me it gained a respect you know they stopped talking about me they stopped laughing at me you know and all this kind of stuff because now they respect me because i'm doing things that they're doing and maybe even doing it better than they do when I got to Tulsa University, they brought six quarterbacks in, all right, trying to make that football team. And uh, I beat out all of them, end up starting and being the captain, and then starting my sophomore year for Tulsa University before I moved to wide receiver going into my junior year. So the challenges are going to be there, the adversities there, and that's what you got to do. You got to fight it. You got to get through it. And you come out on the other end, you become a pro football Hall of Famer. Hut, hut. That's right. That's right. And, you know, John mentioned this before and, and it provided a little sneak peek insight to what we're going to do next. But um, when you go to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, there's there's truly, really one thing you're going there to see. And it's that Hall of Fame gallery where 354 bronze busts are located. So we had to do it today, too. So we've got Nathan Martin, the Youth and Education Coordinator 
outside in our Hall of Fame gallery in front of a bronze bust that probably looks a little familiar to you mm. um, to give us some information about what he's in front of today. So, Nathan, whenever you're ready, go ahead. What do you got, Awesome, Nathan? Awesome, Jake, and thank you, Mr. Pierce, for being a part of this program. I'm on selfie mode, and like Jake said, I'm in the Pro Football Hall of Fame gallery, the place that everyone wants to come to uh, as a player – they want one of these bronze busts, but if you're a fan, this is what you want to see when you come to Canton, Ohio. And for our students back here behind me, you guys might see a familiar face, different hairstyle, but a familiar face uh, behind us back hey, here. So and uh, uh, to put that in perspective, right, how special is it that Drew Pearson is a pro football Hall of Fame, a uh, Hall of Famer? In the history of the game, there's been over 300 million people that have played the game at all levels. There have only been 5 million that were good enough to play the game in college like Pearson did at Tulsa. Of that 5 million, there's only been about 30,000 players in the over 100-year history of the game that have played the game professionally. And there's only 354 that are good enough, lucky enough, and, and blessed to the point where they have been honored as a Pro Football Hall of Famer. I'm going to spin this around so I can give the students a little bit closer look at the bronze bust itself. And they can see this gallery full of them, right? We've got all kinds of great players. We've got great hair. We've got Edron James. We've got Troy Paul Molly with some great hair. But let's not forget about our guy, Mr. Drew Pearson, right here with the afro. All right, put it right up there. Zoom it in close. And we've got to ask you, Mr. Pearson, coming from here, you're one of 354 Pro Football Hall of Famers. And maybe you could tell the students a little bit about when you got to uh, sit down and help the sculptor decide the design. Was it an easy decision for you to go with the Afro because I think you might have the best hair out of all 354 pro football hall of famers here. Was that an easy decision for you? Well, if, since you made that statement, that comment, uh, actually it probably is the best in the pro football hall of fame, <laughs> but I knew, I do know this it's the biggest Afro in the pro football hall of fame because I had the biggest Afro in NFL history when I played believe it or not. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, but when I, uh, went to Granbury, Texas, that's where, uh, the bus was made, uh, and got to see the first rendition of it. I was like, wow, that's all you can do. <laughs> I wanted my Afro a little bigger. And he said, Drew, it's 19 inches. I said, that's all. I said, yeah, that's all. I said, why only 19 inches? He says, that's all the hall will let you have. Okay. <laughs> so we can have room for the other bus. Okay. So anyway, uh, that's how I wanted it to, to be, uh, because that's Drew Pearson when he played in the NFL. This is Drew Pearson post NFL. Okay. <laughs> Y'all laughing, but you'll be with me one day. Okay. But, uh, that's the way I wanted to be in the pro football hall of fame. And I think that's the biggest Afro in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Can Absolutely. You that? It is the biggest Afro, and 19 <laughs> inches is all that we could give you because we got to have room for Mr. Bill Nunn, whose his bus is right uh, above yours. Yes, so uh, it is definitely a special place, and you've got a great class uh, with you. And uh, I'm going to send it back to Jake, though, for a couple more questions to wrap things up. Awesome. Good stuff, Thank man. You, Thank you. Uh, we're going to throw it back out to our schools here as we uh, start to wind down the program. We're going to throw it out to Orange High School for our next question. So our students there at Orange, go ahead and uh, step up to the microphone and ask your question. Uh, how you doing? It's Grant Bell from Orange High School. My question would uh, kind of go back to where we started with uh, leadership and um when you play football, you definitely face some adversity there, but you being a captain and a leader at that, how do you take others along with you on that journey when you're facing ups and downs of a season, turmoil of life, and just general leadership and carrying guys um, and family members, girls alike, through that situation and through, the, through those time periods? Yeah, in those kind of situations, uh, Grant, you got to lead by example. You know, you go out there and do your thing. You know, it might be even after a game that you lost, the team is down. You know, you got to go out there and pick them up. You got to have lively practices. You got to uh, instigate things in practice just to get people motivated and do those kind of things. You got to do what other people might not want to do. And if you do it the right way, and if you have a uh, little respect, 
little notoriety, a little authority behind your name, then people are going to follow you. And that's what it's all about, being able to do the right things to get people to follow you to try to motivate them and overcome any negative situation that they might be going through or the team might be going through at that point. So uh, being a leader is uh, very important. Uh, everybody can't be a leader. There's got to be followers. But, hey, don't be a follower. Be a leader. Let the other people be a follower. Okay? That's what it's all about. And one of the most, like I said, one of the things I'm most proud of is I was cap one of the captains of the Dallas Cowboys and picked by one of the greatest leaders that I ever coached in the National Football League, the great Tom Landry, who's a Hall of Famer himself. So when he chooses you to lead the team, you got to step up and do the right things. And it's not just out there in the practice field, in the meetings, being attentive, uh, answering questions, not sitting in the back room, falling asleep, you know, all those kind of things you got to do as a leader to step up and set that example for others to follow. And then at the end of that, when you win football game, I played 11 years in the NFL. I never had a losing season. I made the playoffs 10 of those 11 years. Of those 10 playoff appearances, I played in seven NFC championship games, which means 11 times, uh, seven times in an 11-year career, I was one game away from seven Super Bowls. Wow. You it can't say Brady. that in Houston. It was Tom Brady before it was cool. Huh? So you were Tom Brady before, before it, was it was cool. cool. Yeah. Could have played in seven Super Bowls, ended up playing in three, winning one. But it was about the leadership that got us there. It's not just Drew Pearson's leadership. Roger Staubach, Tony Dorsett, Too Tall Jones. You heard of him? You know? Guys like Randy the Master White. All these great players were part of the leadership team that led the Dallas Cowboys to success? That's a great uh, question, Grant. Yes, thank yes, you. thank you for that. And then now we're going to head to our last interactive school for today, and that is Woodmont Middle School. So go ahead, folks there at Woodmont, go ahead and unmute your microphone. Uh, have your students step up there and go ahead and ask your question for us here uh, today. What kind of work ethic? Oh, my bad. My name is Marcus Castaneda. And I'm here from Woodmont Middle School, and I want to know what kind of football effort did it take for you and your team to get to the Super Bowl? It took a great effort, you know. Through the course of the season, you don't know how things are going to go. You know, you plan, you set goals. We always used to set goals going into the season. To set goals, we set a reasonable goal and an outstanding goal. The reasonable goal was to win the NFC East and get into the playoffs. The outstanding goal was once we got in the playoffs, we wanted to win the Super Bowl. So we set goals to try to achieve what we wanted to achieve. But we didn't just set goals. We established ways, means, and methods to achieve those goals. And we tried to carry those things out along the way. But through a course of an NFL season, you're going to run into a lot of adversity. You're going to run into challenges, uh, injuries, uh, players, uh, problems, uh, uh, things of that nature, playing back-to-back -back games, playing on a Sunday, then coming back and playing on a Thursday and all those kind of things and uh, being motivated and ready to play. But those are the things that you got to come through to be a champion, okay? The road to a championship is not paved with gold, all right? There's a lot of rocks and bricks and boulders along that road that you got to overcome to become a champion. And that's why when you come out on the other end, and you win that Super Bowl, the feeling, you see these guys when they win a Super Bowl, how crazy they get and how excited they are because they know what they overcame to get there. And if you get there, like seven, seven times being in an NFC championship game and going to three Super Bowls, those two Super Bowls I lost, it was very disappointing because you don't know if you're ever going to get there again. You don't know if you're ever going to overcome those kind of challenges and obstacles again along that you faced along the way. So when you get in that position, you want to take advantage of it. And thank goodness and good Lord allow us to take advantage one time to win this Super Bowl. And I'm still bragging about it today. Hood, hood. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thank you there to our students. At thank Woodmont. you, sir. Um, I do want to throw it back to the Hall of Fame. Uh, Jerry's got one more question we, we want to look at from our Facebook audience. We want to make sure we get some of their questions in as well. So, Jerry, floor is yours for our Facebook question. All right. Thank you, Jake. And, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Pearson, we heard a lot um, uh, about your faith throughout your, your talk here today. Uh, and obviously, and I'll use a Bible term, it's a cornerstone to who you are. And, and uh, so we have a question from a school. It's not only a national program, it's international. We have a, 
uh, school. They, they've submitted a number of them, but um, the one I'm going to hone in on here is Southside Christian School, who is in Red Deer, Alberta, Canada. And uh, they say, earlier you made a comment on how the good Lord gives us talents. How has your faith impacted your journey? Whoa, that's a great question. Have, yeah, how long do we have? Yeah, how long do we have? Because it's all my journey is all about faith and believing in myself and believing in the good Lord that he has a plan for me. Jeremiah 29, 11, look it up. That's my favorite Bible verse. You know, the good Lord has a plan for all of us. It's not for disaster. Uh, it's not for uh, failure. It's for hope. It's for good. And if you believe in him wholeheartedly, you'll come to fruition. Those great things that you're trying to achieve. And, you know, I waited 38 years to get in the 